Thank you for downloading this episode of In Our Time. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk slash radio4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. In Bybrook Cemetery in Ashford, Kent, lies the grave of Simone Weil, the French philosopher and social activist, described by her compatriot Albert Camus as the only great spirit of our time. A simple tombstone states that she died at the age of 34 from tuberculosis. Not long after her death, an unknown admirer added a small plaque bearing an inscription in Italian, <coughs> which translates as, My solitude held in its grasp the grief of others till my death. A quotation which reveals a great deal about the life of a woman whose central philosophical tenet and focus in life was to emphasise with the sufferings of others, always at her own expense. Simone Weil's life may have been short, but her achievements are vast. An inspiration to a pope, several writers and philosophers, she has been dismissed by some as a mystic. So who was she really, and how, how is her philosophy and writing viewed today? With me to discuss Simone Weil are um, Beatrice Hanpile, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Essex, Stephen Plant, Runcie Fellow and Dean of Trinity Hall at the University of Cambridge, and David Levy, Teaching Fellow in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Edinburgh. Beatrice saint Simone Weil was born in 1909 in Paris. Could you give us a sketch of her background? And sure. Uh, she was born to a fairly well-off, uh, non-practicing Jewish family. Her father was a medical doctor, and uh, she had a slightly older brother, André, uh, who was three years older than her. And um, her mother wanted to do medical school, but she was discouraged from doing it, and so she focused on her two children. Now, two things struck me when I read about uh, Simone's uh, childhood. One is that even from a very young age, she um, elicited an incredible ability to empathize with the suffering of others. And so when the First World War was declared, she was five, and she said she would forego uh, eating sugar because it wasn't available to soldiers on the front. Now, the other thing that really struck me is her relation with her brother. Uh, she was by no means stupid, far from it, but her brother was incredibly uh, gifted. Apparently, age 12, he was able to solve doctoral-level mathematical problems. He, uh, his idea of relaxation was to read the classics in Greek. So uh, Simone grew, she could have grown jealous, but she grew terribly depressed. And she says in her notes that when she was about 15, she experienced months of inward darkness. Uh, but these were rewarded by uh, the discovery of something which was to stay with her the rest of her life, and that is the importance of attention. She says in her notes that uh, she realized that not everybody had the gifts of her brother, but that through a genuine focused attention, the realm of truth was open to everyone. So um, after that, uh, she did the standard thing for uh, gifted French students. She took the entrance exam to the École Normale Supérieure, the elite French school. She passed it. She uh, took the Agrégation de Philosophie, the qualifying exam for French te for teachers, and passed it too. Now, during all that time, she, and she went on teaching, and during all that time, she was also a political activist. Uh, apparently, her fellow students said that every time she, they saw her, she wanted them to sign something, some kind of petition. And when she started teaching, uh, she very much tried to live according to her beliefs. And so uh, she was a left-wing uh, political activist, and so she didn't want any heating in her rooms because it wasn't you know, available for the unemployed. She uh, lived on almost nothing. She had very little. She always tried really to uh, practice what she preached, uh, so to speak. So we have... Uh, thank you very much. But we... I think that in saying she wasn't as clever as her brother, who became a inf very influential <laughs> mathematician, she did learn several languages when she was of a course. young girl. She 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 did beat Simone de Beauvoir in exams. She was one of four women only in the second year when they took women to get in the place. She was in her own way, although not as clever as her brother, and a stunningly brilliant woman. That's fair enough, isn't of it? Of course she was, yeah, yes. So let's start that. And um, the social activism, trade union marches, and right from the beginning, this business of determined to empathise, not only empathize with, match the living conditions of the poorest people around her. That was sort of, un, that was just part of her character from yes. extremely early on. Um, 
the far end of that, in a way, is having done brilliantly at university and taught in, in, a, in a very fine school and got on with her writing, she went to work in a car factory for, for quite a while. Yes. Uh, when she was 25, she decided to take a year of sabbatical, but instead of going to you know, some, somewhere in the sun, uh, she decided to enroll in a car factory. And this had a profound effect on on her life. For one thing, she worked in three car factories, in fact, because after a few months in the first one, she was in such a state, she had to stop, recover, and then start again. Uh, But uh, I think two, at least two things are really striking about that. And one is how she made the decision because she didn't do it for fun. And she didn't do it either, she says, out of, you know, carefully rational, uh, considered uh, deliberation. She said that she felt a peculiar impulse, uh, which was such that having felt it, even though it seemed to demand the impossible, she, it would have been the greatest of evils not to follow it. So it was a choice and not a choice at the same time. And I think it's the first time she experienced something that was really important to her later. It's her sense of freedom as obedience, as you know, doing what is required. Now, the other thing, sorry. Uh, no, can I move on yeah, for sure. a moment? I'm sorry. Uh, David Levy, uh, her philosophy, Simone's philosophy can be seen it's, as u- unique in many ways, but who were her major influences? Well, <clears throat> I think in almost uh, everything she did, Plato was by her side. Uh, Plato was, in one sense, her master, I would have said. And um, I think it's important to understand that her formation, her educational formation, was philosophical. I mean, that was really um, the milieu in which she felt most comfortable. So Plato was certainly her master, and I would have said her antagonist was probably Descartes. Um, so she wrote her dissertation on Descartes. She um, was very often responding to the kinds of problems that she felt we had inherited from from him. Of course, uh, as a beneficiary of a very fine French education, she'd also um, had other philosophical influences, uh, Kant, Spinoza. She was very interested in Marx at one point. Um, and Although of course, she said, pointed out that Marx and others had never worked <coughs> in a car factory. Indeed, she she actually became very critical of Marx and Marx, a Marxist uh, ideology, um, but I don't think that hides the fact that they were influential in her in her philosophical formation. Um, the other person who is not very well known, but who was a very big influence on her, was uh, her high school. I suppose you'd say her high school teacher of philosophy, Alain, who um, kind of gave her uh, the idea that 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 the the problem philosophically that we faced was a question of um, what to do with our wills, what kind of action to undertake. And it was this that she opposed to Descartes in her um, in her dissertation, where she replaced the normal, I think, therefore I am, with I will, therefore I am, or I want, therefore I am. And that gave her um, an idea that was to stay with her philosophically, that uh, man is a kind of creature of activity. So she's, from a quite a young age, she's willing not only to take on, but to challenge some of the greatest philosophers in the Western canon. You say she was influenced by Plato. Now, Plato is a mountain. Which bits particularly was she influenced by? Well, I think, I mean, I think, first I mean, of all, uh, she she also was reading Greek at a, a relatively young age. She certainly read Greek well by 12. Um, she was very familiar with all of um, Plato's um, writing. Different things... Um, what is his uh, idea of the shapes, the other world? And so I, I wouldn't have said that was the sole one. So, for right. example, uh, in the symposium, uh, Diotima speaks of love, eros, as um, a kind of demon. Um, and she didn't mean demon in the kind of demonic sense, but as something between our world and the world of the gods. And this was the first example of how love was a kind of intermediary between our world and the world of the divine. So that would be an example of something she took from um, the symposium. Did she get anything of an ideal person from Plato himself or from what Plato had written? Uh, I I wouldn't have said so. I mean, she was certainly influenced by the Republic. So, for example, she often talked about the great beast, which was the kind of uh, the danger of the the collective, of the group. And that's uh, something that uh, uh, Plato spoke about in the Republic. But I think the idea of an ideal person is um, probably not something she got, but she did pick up a, a 
a problem that the Greeks really wrestled with, which is uh, the problem of being, if you like, incarnated, or as they would put it, as being hylomorphs. So creatures that have a body with a particular form and shape and a particular presence in space and time. That problem, the problem of what kind of creatures we are because we have substance, was a problem that she wrestled with and that really was... um, a vehicle for her to engage in Christianity uh, and, and religious thinking later. Now, I have to give a balance between her philosophy, which is very serious and at a very high level, that's yeah. enough for one life, but also sure. her social activism, which is enough for one life. And her, what she, the way she treated herself, we might come to the mysticism and the denial of food and so on, but now we turn to the social activism. She, um, she previously embraced pacifism, but in the Spanish Civil War, she went to Spain to, to be on the side of the Republican Party and wanted to go to the front and so on. Had an accident, didn't make, but still, can you describe that change of mind? Yeah, to some extent. I mean, you're quite right to say she was formed philosophically, but what moved her was her political engagement. And in particular, something that Beatrice said, um, her ability to relate to those who were unprivileged, those who were being oppressed, those who were being turned into things by the collective. And in this She's case... She's very good on that, being turned into a thing by the... Uh, being lacerated, abs- so even your imagination was driven out. A- absolutely, and that's one of the things she learned in the car factory. She, she often spoke of having been branded, of having been marked, of having been turned into a slave by her work there. So, so that was an important thing. When the, civil, the Spanish Civil War uh, broke out, she, first of all, was moved by the compassion that we've already uh, heard about, but also by the idea that... Um, those who were privileged uh, ought not to be separated from those who were who are going to suffer. As you also said, uh, she had come out of university a pacifist. Uh, shortly after university, she'd gone to Germany to see the trade union movement there, which was the most advanced in Europe, and concluded that they were no match for the fascists. So from an early uh, point, she had a kind of... Uh, uh, doom-laden view of how things were likely to go with fascism. And accurate. And, and accurate. She was one of the people who was probably the least surprised by how, how the world went. Um, and so it was her recognition of the way that fascism could uh, crush people, in particular could uh, extinguish human dignity, that moved her initially to say the use of violence in the Spanish Civil War in a controlled way could be right. But that's not what she learned there. Briefly, what she learned there. What she learned is that uh, there's no way safely to use force. Force corrupts those who use it and um, those who, who suffer from it. And that's what she was able to express in her, uh, her brilliant um, article, The Iliad or the Poem of Force. Did, she, did this seal her distrust of commun- uh, Marxism and the Communist Party? I, I, I sh- certainly would... Yes, it would be fair to say that it sealed it, but it was pretty well broken before then. <laughs> Stephen Platt, we go and we, we've talked about a little... I think this is the introduction of the program about philosophy and a, li- a little about um, uh, social activism. But then it's her, it's her struggle with herself, isn't it? So that's a third thing. Over to you, then. Now, for instance, a great aversion to physical intimacy, her tutor who, uh, who thought she was brilliant, which indeed she was, and her fellow students dubbed her as the Red Virgin at the school, um, at, at, the, at the university and so on. Can you tell us about that part of her personality and how it played in what she did and wrote? Well, we're in- en- entering some um, choppy waters here because um, in discussing anybody whose life is as intimately tied up with their thinking... Um, there's a danger that we start to psychoanalyse somebody who we don't have available to us as a living person anymore. Um, that's always a problem when you deal with the biography of great thinkers, but it's particularly a problem with, with Simon Weil, whose life and thoughts are, um, as it were, illustrations each of the other, um, with art imitating life and life imitating art. And you mention her aversion to intimacy. This is quite a good example of the way in which her um, thought and her life um, feed it, feed upon or in, feed each other or feed upon one another. <laughs> Um, her biographer Simon Petremont who was also a friend and fellow student at the Ecole Normale um, reports an incident when she was a child which presumably her biographer had from Simon's mother in which a relative had kissed a very innocent gesture, kissed Simon's hand and she had become horrified by this and rushed off and scrubbed at her hands with carbolic soap um, aged about five or six Now she grew up in a medical household so microbes in a period before antibiotics would have been present to the family's imagination but there was something rather um, exaggerated in their horror um, of germs 
which she seems to have picked up on, which may have been exacerbated by a period in hospital. Where it gets interesting is the way in which that intersects with her life. Um, she she was, f from pretty much the outset, um, a kind of walking brain. Another of the nicknames used for her in her student days was the Martian, after a science fiction film of a creature with a very large brain. The Mekong. Uh, ex indeed, and um, I think Alan coined that nickname for her and described her as a purely intellectual being, and she, she rather played up to that. In her defence... Um, she was, as Beatrice said, in the second year of women admitted to the Ecole Normale. I mean, what was a woman supposed to do in this context where there were very few women and when women were struggling to compete in a world which was dominated by men? None of her teachers were men. So what was she to all do? All of her teachers were men. All of her, oh, that's right, sorry, I beg your pardon. All of her teachers were men. So one of the ways she does that is to play up to this asexual, rather masculine identity uh, in the way she dressed. She wore flat shoes berets rather than hats, rather dour, um, tweedy suits, um, and this was the dress that she affected throughout her life. Um, uh, no makeup. Uh, her biographer again reports the possibility that she may have had a crush on one of her student peers, but it, in general terms, she resisted these kinds of intimate relationships in spite of having a very happy family background in which there was closeness, there was affection, and there was laughter. Now this feeds into her thinking um, in that uh, she believed that truth was something essentially impersonal. If I say to you 2 plus 2 equals 4, that's not a truth which has to do with my opinion. It's simply an impersonal truth. And she believed that the deepest kinds of truth had that kind of quality, the kind of quality of geometry. And she felt that, therefore, personal relationships had in them um, a corrupting imperfection and that aiming at personal intimacy was in a sense a distraction or a, a blind alley with respect to the perfection of God. Can you do a big switch for us here Stephen Plant because it's important that now we get on this track. She was born into a Jewish family which were not Orthodox Jews and they, um, and they didn't behave in any way like Orthodox Jews yet she didn't, quite soon she didn't consider herself a, a Jew but um, she turned away from that very emphatically. Is there any one reason why? This is this is one of the most difficult um, aspects of Vey's life and thought to talk about. Um, you're right, she, she did reject both any racial connection to the Hebrews of the um, period before the exile, and she also said um, in a letter to a Vichy official in 1940 that she had never been to a synagogue, never seen any religious ceremonies, and that she had no connection to Judaism as a religion. Um, if that were all that were that there were there was to it, we, we perhaps wouldn't need to talk about it very much. Um, but she goes far deeper than that, and there's a shrill, rather hysterical character to her rejection of Judaism, which which leaves a bitter taste actually relative to her other aspects of her thought. She believed that there were two kinds of God and two kinds of religion: a good God, as it were, and an evil God, a God of force, as David said, and also a good religion, a religion of mysticism and of truth and an evil religion, one of force and of nationalism and of a self, a self assertion. And she believed that Judaism was the archetype of that bad sort of religion. And she went to extraordinary lengths to make this point. She, she said, for example, that in the Bible, um, only some of the books of the Bible were worth preserving. She thought that Job, bits of Isaiah were preservable because they were essentially Egyptian. Um, she said some bizarre things, for instance, that Jesus must have said the Lord's Prayer in Greek because Greek is the real big influence on Christianity and not its Judaism. So we have to turn now to Christianity, Beatrice Hanpile, where she was attracted passionately to Christianity and particularly to the idea of Christ on the cross and the idea that God had abandoned the world. But this, can you, and, and this was reinforced, sorry to be more in, but there's a lot to say by her two or three powerful mystical experiences. Can you bring that together in an answer which takes the listener in the direction we want to go, which is her philosophy through this, this Christian passion? Okay, I can try. Uh, po possibly the first thing to say is that she uh, repeatedly says that she never sought God, that she was found. Uh, and uh, when she had these mystical experiences, she hadn't even read the mystics, so it came as a complete surprise. And the first one happened when she was in Assisi. She says that she felt a power stronger than her will compel her to her knees. Uh, 
Uh, and a year later, she was in a Benedictine monastery in Solem. And there uh, she suffered one of her splitting headaches because all her life she was plagued with these this terrible migraines uh, which gave her a daily acquaintance to suffering. And she says she was able to leave the flesh huddled in a corner and to rise to uh, the ecstasy of the music. And it's then that she discovered, well, she was, didn't discover it, she was given a poem by a 17th century uh, poet called George Herbert on love. And she took to reciting that poem. And during one of these recitations, she says that Christ came down and took possession of her. So she had a very direct uh, experience of, uh, of the divine. And it's very significant, I think, that this experience happened at the height of suffering, you know, when she, she had these terrible uh, headaches. And, uh, and so uh, then uh, God, she says, uh, became a person as opposed to be uh, to being a problem that she, that was best uh, left alone so the incarnation for her is extremely uh, important because she has this conception uh, of love as radical self sacrifice and the incarn- there are several instances of that uh, for her in uh, in biblical uh, in the biblical text one is creation in genesis and the other is incarnation uh, and the thought there is that uh, in the case of creation, uh, God expressed his love for us by uh, accepting to be less than he is, by making room for us, so to speak, by creating space, time and us, all imperfect things, and accepting to withdraw from there so that we could come into existence. So there's this sense that the utmost of love is self-denial, self-sacrifice. And of course, that's what she sees in the incarnation uh, as well, because again, uh, God the Father first accepts to be less than what he is by uh, taking human, uh, you know, finite, imperfect form. And secondly, that finite form is sacrificed uh, for us, for the redemption of our sins. And she sees the incarnation, and in particular the moment on the cross where uh, where Christ, you know, cries to God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, that's the, the depth of abandonment. And for her, that's paradoxically the moment where you can see, you know, the, the, the height of God's love. David. Uh, Levy, sorry, sorry. David Levy, can you tell us how this featured in our ideas about doing good in the world? Well, um, I think the the first thing to um, to be clear about is a kind of difference between good in the world and absolute good. So, in the world, uh, good and evil, as we ordinarily think of them, uh, were sort of opposites that uh, created a unity. And so in that sense, um, absolute good was something quite different from ordinary mundane good. Um, And in practice, what that meant was that one was not going to, let's say, uh, make it to heaven, if that's that's the way you wanted to think of it, uh, by doing good acts. So morality, as we ordinarily understand it, was not her conception of doing good in the world. Um, so what was her conception of saving plant? Well, she, she, she thinks that you engage the world by means of what she calls forms of the implicit love of God. Um, she thought that you uh, could not love God, and this was a point that she derived not just from Christian, Christian mysticism, which we'd mentioned, but from... Um, an epistemological point of point about the theory of knowledge that you God is not. not you, you, you want uh, human beings could not could love not God. grasp God and in that is, way. Is, did she believe the reverse as well that God could not love human beings? No, she didn't believe that. Right. Um, and she didn't believe either that God wasn't a real, f- f- um, wasn't real. It's just that the human imagination isn't the kind of thing that can grasp God in that way. But she did believe that there were forms of what she called implicit love of God. She includes in them beauty, uh, friendship. Uh, and even religious ceremony, and she thinks these are things which you uh, um, engage, and that though they are imperfect, they can, in a sense, lead you towards the perfect good, um, and that we encounter the world. She, she used as a very, very imaginative simile of a cell wall um, between which two prisoners bash out messages to each other, um, you know, by Morse code or something. And she thought that the, the kind of there was a possibility of communicating between humankind and God. 
uh, that's through these implicit to develop forms. It. She uses the wall, doesn't she? She uses the blind man stick. But can you just say a little more about why the wall is significant? It's a very good metaphor. It is, you've, you've said it, but can you say more about it? Well, she, I mean, if you imagine two, two, two prisoners in a cell that are divided by a wall, they can't see each other, they can't speak to each other. So how are they to communicate? Well, one classic way of communicating is by banging messages on a type using a, on a pipe using a primitive form of Morse code. This is um, one way that prisoners communicate. And she uses this as a, a metaphor. By the way, metaphor is a very interesting device they frequently use to convey her meaning. Um, she... She uses this metaphor to speak about the, the ways in which human beings relate to each other and relate to God, that you can't actually grasp the other, but the universe that stands between you and the other is something through which you nonetheless can communicate. David Levy, it's a brilliant metaphor. David yeah, and I, I, I just wanted to amplify that. The idea, I take it, is that though we are separated, we're not out of contact. So even though God has removed himself from the world... Uh, that doesn't mean that, as it were, he's inaccessible to us. Uh, there are these intermediaries of which the wall is um, an example. Um, there, there are other inter intermediaries as well, uh, which give us an intimation of, of God. And so even though he's absent from our world, he is accessible in, that, in, in some sense. Beatrice Hanpan, how does her, how does <coughs> Simone Weil's conception of love and God <coughs> differ from orthodox? <coughs> Excuse me. Differ from that. Differ from that of Orthodox Christianity. Right. Well, one way to see this is to oppose it to perhaps the two most usual models to think of love. And one is erotic love, and the other is what you might call parental love. So in the first case, you want to possess the object, and in the second, you want to nurture it. You want to nurture it for its own sake. And that is often, that second sense is often used to understand the relation of God to the creation. You know, God as a father who knows every hair on our heads and who nurtures us through history in spite of evils in the world uh, by means of providence. Now, Simone Weil completely rejected that. She doesn't think that there is such a thing as providence. There's only necessity, she says, and, and both sun and rain come from God. What does she mean by necessity? Uh, well, she meant, uh, she meant the, also what she calls uh, the realm of force, uh, the idea that the universe uh, is sort of left to its own devices, so everything happens in it through causality. It's only uh, only spiritual things are not affected by uh, by this mechanical necessity. Uh, and it expresses, she says, we experience it as blows. So most of the time we, we experience it as a cause of suffering. Now, she, so she doesn't think that, you know, God is nurturing in that way, nor that he looks after the creation in, in that way. Uh, and she's certainly not like many uh, philosophers who present theodicies, who say, you know, there's evil in the world, but it's not that bad, or it's all for a good cause. It's quite the opposite. She fully recognizes how awful, quite often, a, a human situation is, and she really empathizes emph with it. So to, her idea of love is quite iconoclastic. It's really the sense that love is this radical self-denial, radical self-sacrifice, that you have to uh, make room, let the object be. And she thinks that... God loves us in that way, and that this is the way we have to love God through the theme of what she calls decreation. David Levy, decreation, that's the word I'd like you to uh, address, if you don't mind. Uh, can you explain what she meant by decreation? Well, it, it's a, a, a term of her own, and it has very specialized meaning and a kind of um, system of concepts that constitute her cosmic view. So it, it's difficult to give it uh, in brief, but I suppose it's easiest to see the sense of decreation by understanding it as being related to the act of creation, and specifically God's act of creation. So uh, as we heard earlier, um, when God created us, he limited himself. He, if you like, created the space, uh, the space for us. And uh, he limited himself in his perfection and in his, his power to create the space uh, for us. The act of decreation becomes possible because of his act of creation. And what we're trying to do when we decreate ourselves is in some sense reverse some of that act of, of creation. So we are trying to reverse God's act of giving us the ability to say I. I. 
uh, of uh, God's ability to for us to think of ourselves as uh, a self with a body, with uh, desires, and with interests in particular. And by extinguishing the self, if you like, by um, uh, relinquishing the ability to say I, by taking uh, a different sort of perspective, we would be reversing the act of creation and coming uh, closer to God, would be one way to put it. Does that bring in, uh, Stephen Plant, the notion of attention? It does, because what, one of the things she does is to say that uh, in order to achieve this decreation, in order to um, stop saying I, but instead to become a part of this universal universe, um, uh, one one needs to pay attention. And one another another of the terms that she uses to describe uh, how to affect this decreation is uh, is affliction. That she she has the notion that um, affliction is a distinctive concept for her. She uses a word malheur in French, which she asserts doesn't have a, an equivalent in other languages, which sometimes is translated affliction, sometimes woe. And the point about affliction is that it's total. It has no relief. It's uh, so. Is the person afflicted? The person who is afflicted has no possible hope. They're uh, I mean, demolished she, by the experience of affliction. Go, but does she, it's more than suffering. Everybody's, sorry, does she mean that everybody is afflicted? Or everybody is potentially herself? afflicted. <coughs> but affli affliction, normally suffering is alleviated in some way, so a toothache or something. Mm. Um, you know, it's there, and then you sort it out, and it's gone. It's not, and it doesn't affect your soul. She thinks of affliction as something which potentially aff aff affects everybody, but which penetrates right down to the very depths of you, um, demolishing you as a human being. It's what she experienced in the factory. It's what she experienced when she had her migraine headaches, a kind of deconstruction of yourself as a person. And it connects also with, with the idea of um, necessity because she asserts that this, uh, this kind of affliction can be an avenue or a route to knowledge of God. Um, she thinks that um, if you embrace necessity much as one might clasp in the hand a keepsake from a lover, you know, clasp it so tightly that it actually hurts you, you embed by that experience of affliction an encounter with the world, which can also be an encounter with God. And that though affliction is something one must never seek, it's completely unnatural to seek affliction. She says that it's, it can be a way of experiencing contact between uh, creation and God. David, David, I, I wanted to try and make uh, this seem uh, a little bit more mundane in the sense of how we might imagine what she's getting at. And that's the, exactly what I was going to ask. Oh, good. Well, and the sort of the, I think one way to put it is this: imagine the sort of melancholy that sets in, for instance, after a love affair has gone has ended and gone badly wrong. And in that moment of melancholy, one is often rather more lucid about one's situation, about one's faults, and so forth. As it were, that experience of the kind of suffering of which melan melancholy is uh, a, a symptom is an opportunity to see that actually, you know, you are selfish or you are um, self-serving in various ways. And what she would say is that, as it were, in that moment, we stop putting our own readings on the world. We stop sort of interpreting the world to our own advantage, to serve our own ego. At that moment, we become egoless insofar as we uh, are unable to put those spins on things. The, the suffering uh, in the wake of the love affair, as it were, makes us momentarily lucid. Beatrice, um, Beatrice Hanpal, she came, she went to New York uh, in 1942, then came back, then came to this country uh, with a view to, well, she did join the the, the uh, organisation that Charles de Gaulle had set up here and wanted to be parachuted into, into France with, uh, with a, a, a troop of, of nurses and had, had very strong ideas. He asked her to write a, help write a constitution which was full of spiritual notions which he he couldn't accept. Um, can you tell us about her, her political work at that time, what she was aiming for politically? Well, she had this uh, sense that um, we, uh, our relations with sorry, with others shouldn't be based uh, on rights, uh, paradoxically enough, uh, but that uh, we uh, 
that you know she 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 took very seriously the idea of uh, love of a neighbor in uh, the Christian uh, in the Christian tradition as uh, a form of non-preferential love. So uh, it's not like loving your friends or or your family or anything of that kind. Uh, the thought was that uh, there is something in other people just by uh, virtue of being human, just by virtue of sharing the, the, the spiritual uh, shard that we, we, we get from God, so to speak, that uh, was uh, per se reason enough for us to be obligated to help uh, others uh, and uh, to, to have a duty to do that. And she felt very strongly that this was something that uh, we could only do to go back to the theme of decreation that David was was talking about, she felt very strongly that this was something we can we could only do if we somehow uh, did not do it in our own name, because otherwise it would be tantamount to sort of uh, taking possession of the offer. Uh, she says at one point, you know, who but Christ can give meat to uh, to to the famished, and so the thought was in that in uh, in that realm too, uh, the eye had to disappear, and that we had to reach that sort of level where supernatural uh, love uh, and justice uh, take hold of human affairs. Steve, and sorry, Stephen Plant, she's entering into realms here, which are. Gide and Camus talked about her spiritual qualities. De Gaulle thought she was mad because, uh, uh, because, because of them, as it were. Um, she wrote this book, which, uh, which Beatrice has referred to, The Need for Roots, Rights and Obligation, which seems to be a very sensible... So we're, we're running spirituality and mysticism against an steamly uh, uh, recognisable French um, sense, as it were. Can you just dwell well, on that? Yeah, well, the, the Need for Roots is a very mixed bag. I mean, it's got some things in there which are completely sensible and, and which um, you know would be recognised as potentially important politically. But there are other things. For instance, the relationship between love of Christ and love of country, which she explores, um, which, which you can see why de Gaulle thought these things were not really sensible. But there is another reason why de Gaulle disliked the book, which was that she distances herself from the idea that states are something that people can really love. Because they're kind of penultimate, because they're imperfect, you can have a conditional love for your country, but not an unconditional love. God is the only thing that she has all the way back from her philosophical training in Plato. The only thing that you can love perfectly is, is, has to be perfect itself, which is God. So she, she develops this in terms of a mo another metaphor, the metaphor of roots um, and of uprootedness, which she explores in relation to concrete historical developments in France, in which she sees ironically and unusually that the moment when French identity is created is a great moment of uprooting, which is to say the revolution in 1789, which uproots France from all its previous traditions and recreates it as an object of love. And she explores that and then concludes in the book with some arguments about how you might achieve rootedness, which again recapitulate um, a theme we haven't touched on very much, which is the theme of education. She was very interested in one of the ways in which you deal with injustice in the world is to educate people um, rather than simply bringing about a revolution. You you teach them poetry, and this is what humanises people and in a way overcomes the process of affliction. I'm very grateful to all of you because it is, it's, it's a short life, but it's extraordinarily packed and it's on different levels. Um, but David Levy, we have, haven't given the listeners any idea. Did she, she's been, <coughs> we've been isolated by her thoughts, as it were. Were people around her? We have Camus, who's a near contemporary, the Beauvoir's near contemporary. People, was she, did she talk to them, correspond with them? Was she part of that group in Paris at the time and so on? I think it would be fair to say that um, her notoriety while she was alive wasn't that great. I mean, she published in a couple of um, radical, not academic journals, more like journals of radical politics or perhaps literature. Uh, she was frequently teaching in provincial, uh, in provincial areas. She took time off uh, to work in the car factory. She took time off uh, to go to the Spanish Civil War. So in that sense, um, I wouldn't have said it was right to say that she was uh, part of the intellectual milieu at that time. I mean, she was making a contribution, but she wasn't particularly well known. There were people that she spoke to. She, uh, especially latterly, she spoke to um, uh, 
more than one Dominican uh, Dominican uh, where she was able to have discussions. She spent quite a bit of time on uh, Gustav Thibon's uh, farm and spoke to him. He was a kind of Catholic autodidact and author. Um, she was uh, tremendously engaged with other people. Everywhere she went, she tried to teach people. And it didn't matter whether they were uh, the the least educated formally. She was prepared to try and teach them uh, Greek philosophy or literature or poetry, whatever it was. Yeah, she published her works in workers' journals, didn't she? Audubon. In some cases. Yeah, um, some one of them, uh, the, 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 Iliad of, uh, the, the Iliad, the Poem of Force, was published in um, not so much a workers' journal as a kind of journal of radical thought. Although it's a, <coughs> her name's not widely known, she influenced Broadca- uh, Mugridge, who quoted her a lot, Rowan Williams quoted her a lot, T.S. Eliot did an introduction, Iris Murdoch, we know. Uh, uh, do you, uh, so her influence has, has permeated through the century. I, th- I think there are two, two sorts of influences she has. One, one influence that she has is on Christians like Malcolm Mugridge that you already mentioned, Rowan mm. Williams, um, for whom, though she is not herself orthodox and she wasn't baptised, uh, and indeed uh, opted not to be baptised because she didn't want to identify with the institutional church because it might limit her freedom of thought, which she felt was very, a very bad thing to do. Um, uh, she she had an influence nonetheless as a spiritual writer. So um, you mentioned Pope 20, 20, John Twenty Third, um, Pope Paul the Sixth, both read her and cite her as a as a big influence on their spiritual autobiography. But the second group that she has influenced. Um, are what you might call literary philosophers or perhaps philosophical writers, people like Murdoch, Eliot, uh, Camus, people for whom the, the world of philosophy is something that you want to carry out, as it were, as part of the conversation that is literature. And because of her interest in literature and the way she integrated thinking about literature with philosophy, she has a particular attraction for, for writers of that kind. Finally, I'm afraid, Beatrice Hanpal, she died of... Uh TB, some people said, aggravated by malnutrition, uh, almost a form of anorexia, uh, in <clears throat> 1943. You put your hand, you wanted to say something. Oh, it wasn't about that, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll say something about that. because there is I'm afraid we've got just a few seconds. Right, right OK, it's well, there's a big debate about whether she was an anorexic. Yeah. And I don't know, I'm not a psychiatrist, but one thing I would say, it's a bit like asking, you know, if Christ had schizoid delusions. What I mean by that is that uh, there's possibly a, some, you know, some cases which defy the applicability of medical and standard well, categories, and she might have been one of might. them. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Beatrice Hanpal, David Levy, Stephen Plant. Next week, The Borgias. Thanks for listening. There are many more Radio 4 arts and discussion programmes to download for free. Find these on the website at bbc.co.uk slash radio4.